Hello everybody, um, my name is Philip Elson and I'm a scientific Python technical lead at the, the Met Office, the UK's National Weather Service. Um, and it's my responsibility to make sure that our research scientists have the tools they need to do their job. Um, and that goes from developing and maintaining some of the core libraries like Matplotlib, uh, to developing more specialized software like Cartapy and Iris. Uh, but there's no point in doing any of this if our scientists can't get hold of, of that software. So for me, uh, the, best, the best tool available to us for managing complex scientific software stacks is Conda. Um, and the best thing about Conda, in my opinion, is its ability to install distributions that aren't part of Continuum's managed Anaconda stack. Okay. So that's no slight on Continuum. They do an amazing job. But it simply doesn't scale for a single organization to package all of our diverse software needs. Um, so uh, therefore, I believe uh, we're always going to need uh, communities to package some of their own software. Um, for those of you with, with experience of doing so, so, packaging software is really hard. Uh, and it's doubly hard without dedicated resource and hardware. So I think the only way that we can achieve uh, a good quality packaging for everybody is if we can share tools, experience, uh, and effort. Uh, and really, that's where Conda Forge comes in. So I'm going to start with a little bit of history. Um, the way you get uh, a custom distribution to be installable with Conda is to use Conda Build. Uh, now, Conda Build has the concept of a recipe. And a recipe is basically a, a YAML document. Uh, and this is a perfect format for putting under version control. So there's a, there's a repository under Conda Recipes, which um, I believe was the first repository to put lots of recipes in a, in a Git repo. Uh, and that is an amazing resource. And it's got over 1,000 uh, recipes. I think it started around June 2013. Um, but there are some problems with that. Uh, the recipes in there are of a mixed quality, kind of inconsistent style. Um, and significantly, that is just a repository full of recipes. There is no uh, direct correlation with any packages you can actually install. So if you want those packages, you effectively have to build them yourself. So around SciPy 2014, um, I went about uh, addressing this problem. Um, and I built a tool called Obvious CI, which basically um, I, I needed to build against a, a matrix of uh, NumPy and Python versions. I needed it to build in a sensible order. And I wanted those builds to upload to anaconda.org, so a particular channel. Um, the name is a little bit uh, ironic, kind of traditional British humor. Uh, and I just want to share with you a little video, which kind of highlights how much of a leap this concept felt at the time. So this is the story of Ron Obvious um, of Neep's End. There is an epic quality about the sea, which has throughout history stirred the hearts and minds of English men of all nations. Sir Francis Drake, Captain Webb, Nelson of Trafalgar, and Scott of the Antarctic all rose to the challenge of the mighty ocean. And today, another Englishman may add his name to the golden roll of history, Mr. Ron Obvious of Neep's End. For today, Ron Obvious hopes to be the first man to jump the channel. <laughs> Ron, uh, let's uh, just get this quite clear. You're intending to jump across the English channel. Oh, yes, that is correct, yes. And uh, just how far is that? Oh, well, it's 26 miles from here to Calais. Uh, that's to the beach at Calais. Oh, well, no, no, provided I get a good lift off and uh, maybe a gust of breeze off the French coast, uh, I shall be jumping into the centre of Calais itself. Uh, so, <laughs> where am I? Hopefully that kind of gives you an indication of um, how much of a leap this really felt uh, to actually turn a, a repository full of recipes into uh, a, a built dish, uh, set of uh, distributions that could be used. Uh, unlike Run Obvious, uh, we actually achieved that goal with Obvious CI uh, and eventually renamed Obvious CI to Conda Build All. Uh, and it turns out this tool is actually really quite convenient, even on the command line, if you're not doing continuous integration, 
to build a, a set of recipes. Um, check it out if you've got uh, lots of recipes to build in a particular order. Uh, and honestly, one day I really hope that we can uh, deprecate this and kind of pull that functionality into Conda Build itself. And I think that's genuinely on the cards. So um, we now had a tool that we could make use of with continuous integration on our repositories. So I set about creating uh, the first such repository. Uh, this is Conda Recipe Cytals. So this is for my niche community. Uh, and we packaged up um, around 30 packages uh, and we use continuous integration to do that. Now initially, we only built on uh, Linux and we used Travis CI to do that. Um, there were certain problems with um, things like backwards incompatibility of glibc, which really meant we had to take a similar approach to uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel's approach yesterday of um, building a custom image of an older operating system. Uh, and we ended up running uh, that image using CircleCI uh, and ultimately Docker. We also extended the, the repo to build on Windows using AppVeyer uh, and on OS X to use Travis CI. So this, this model worked really well. Um, and either independently or by making use of the tools that we developed, other such repositories came along. Uh, it's worth mentioning the, uh, the IUS repository, uh, which is an incredibly well curated set of recipes uh, for the Earth Sciences um, Integrated Ocean Observing System. Um, and they packaged in the order of 250 packages. Um, and that's a real, real amazing achievement. The Bioconda community um, went completely independent, didn't use Conda Build all at all. Uh, and they've packaged something of the order of uh, 1,500 packages. Uh, and this is an amazing resource for the bioinformatics community. Uh, and there are other repos uh, which have done this. Uh, and it's been a really successful approach. However, um, there are a few challenges for these kinds of repositories with lots of recipes in them. So uh, it's going to become quickly apparent that all of those recipes in your repository cannot possibly be built on every iteration of your continuous integration. You're going to end up um, kind of absolutely flying past the, the allocated time that continuous integration will allow. So you end up having to do things like inspecting what's already been built to figure out uh, what needs building uh, and ultimately uploading. Uh, as well as that, um, it really uh, takes a lot of discipline when you find a bug with another package uh, not to bring uh, a fix into your own repository so that you can kind of iterate quickly on it. So there's this real big danger of having um, massive scope creep within your repository. Um, one really frustrating thing for, for um, some of the communities the IOs and, and the CITLs one are a good example of this. So there was a, a big overlap in the packages that we provided. Um, and often these recipes were becoming consistent, versions would be different, and they got built slightly differently. Um, and there was no real easy way of sharing those recipes um, in a consistent way. Additionally, if you wanted to give maintainership to, of a particular package to, a, to an individual, that meant uh, exposing the permissions on all recipes in that repository. So you had no kind of fine permission granularity within this big repository type approach. So around 2015, SciPy, we came up with an idea to um, simplify this and to address some of these problems. And that was to take one uh, Conda recipe and put it in one Git repository. To keep all of those uh, repositories in a single place. We made the Conda Forge organization on GitHub. And uh, to give it um, a name that was consistent, we, we came up with the concept of a repository plus the recipe plus the continu continuous integration scripts being called a feedstock. And every single recipe that lives in Conda Forge, each repository, is suffixed with the feedstock name. So having done this, we, um, we really had some big benefits. 
we can always now build everything that's within the repository because everything is just a single recipe. That single repository, recipe repository, has um, not got any scope creep because that's all it's ever going to package. So when we develop software, uh, we do not put lots of different packages in the same repository. Uh, and we've followed the same, same approach with this recipe approach. Um, and that has led us to be able to use the development tools that we make use of every day when developing software, namely uh, the fact that we can use branches and we have a dedicated issue tracker for uh, particular packages. Uh, additionally, we get the ability to have per package permissions uh, through GitHub Teams and, and the like. Yeah, uh, so the big problem with this approach, uh, it, it's a fantastic model, but uh, the big thing that made all of us very, very nervous about taking this approach was the sheer number of repos that this is gonna result in. Okay. So to address that, um, we developed a tool called Conda Smithy, which basically is a cookie cutter. Input is a, re is a recipe, and output is a Git repository, as, as well as the recipe itself, and the necessary continuous integration script, scripts to build that. Uh, as well as that, we had the ability to make the, the Git repositories, but we also uh, created those Git repositories on GitHub, using the GitHub API, that is. Uh, and we use the Travis CI, uh, Circle CI, and AppFair uh, interfaces, the APIs, to register those repositories um, so that we got automatic continuous integration. Uh, one really uh, invaluable tool that we developed within Conda Smithy was the ability to lint recipes to give us a consistent uh, look and feel of how recipes should look. Uh, and on top of that, uh, not strictly within Conda Smithy, uh, we, we also had the, the ability to automatically scrape uh, names out of the kind of maintainer names which sit within the recipe itself uh, and turn those into GitHub teams so that we had the necessary permissions on the repos. So um, that linter that I showed you or mentioned there, um, there's a command line interface uh, and that's really useful, but we also turn this into a, a service so that whenever someone submits a pull request, uh, it gets linted automatically. Uh, so uh, that encourages uh, people who are submitting pull requests for, to have consistent uh, structure and layout for, for those recipes. Uh, and actually, it turned out to be a really simple thing to implement. Um, it's running on Heroku, um, and it's about 150 lines of uh, Tornado. And if you're really interested in setting up this kind of uh, service, there's a repository on Conda Forge called Conda Forge Maintenance, uh, where this thing lives. And yeah, really accessible code. So as well as that, uh, also running on Heroku, we've got a scheduled task which um, uses Conda Smithy to go through each and every feedstock in the Conda Forge organization. Uh, and re-renders that according to the newest, the latest version of Conda Smithy. So this allows us to kind of roll out updates to how a feedstock should look, uh, and that gradually gets propagated throughout the, the feedstocks on Conda Forge. So we've ended up at a really slick uh, work, workflow to add new packages to the Conda Forge channel. Uh, and I'm just gonna talk you through that right now. Uh, basically, fork the Conda Forge stage recipes repo, add your recipe to the recipes directory, and submit it as a pull request. Okay. And at this point, three things are going to happen. Uh, the linter is going to run away, and it's going to lint your recipe for you and tell you it's either in an excellent form or it's going to tell you why things aren't quite up to standard. As well as that, the continuous integration is going to kick off, and it's going to go and build your recipe on Linux OS X and Windows. And thirdly, you're going to get a human reviewer to just kind of double check uh, and make sure that everything is working nicely. So once those three things are satisfied, the, the pull request will get merged, and then the continuous integration on that repo will go away and use Conda Smithy to register a new Git repository um, to give you a feedstock, including that recipe, and 
it will automatically give you permissions on the newly created repository. And it's at this repository, it's in the feedstock itself, where the continuous integration actually does the, the final build and upload to the Condorforge channel. Okay. So as I said at the very beginning, uh, the, the best way that we can achieve good quality packaging is through kind of collaborating uh, and community. And uh, at Condorforge, we've worked really, really hard to build that community. Um, one way that we're doing that is to hold regular kind of two or three weekly um, hangouts publicly with a public agenda where anybody can attend and we are um, kind of open for requesting new features or uh, just generally help one another out. So hangouts every two to three weeks. Uh, additionally, whenever we package a new piece of software, we typically reach out to the uh, package developers themselves, uh, just letting them know that we've packaged, packaged their code um, and giving them the opportunity to sign up for helping to maintain those recipes. And this has been really invaluable for growing our community base and just making sure that um, things are packaged well. Uh, we've also taken a really open maintenance model and basically uh, the list of maintainers of a recipe is part of the feedstock repository itself. So if at any point you want to help maintain a particular package, all you need to do is open a pull request uh, and those, the existing maintainers can go ahead and uh, add you to the team by merging that pull request. So um, Condorforge has grown absolutely massively in about six months. It's been a, a bit of a whirlwind um, experience. Uh, but we've got a few things for making Condorforge even better than it, than it is currently. Uh, as I said, there are com some communities out there already who are building recipes, uh, and I would love to be sharing uh, more ideas, poten potentially infrastructure, but not necessarily, um, and just generally collaborating more with uh, other communities. Uh, one thing that we're kind of doing on the side already, but thing that, something I'd like to do more of, is to package release candidates. So. Um, as a community, we really struggle to get release candidates out to users, and I think Condorforge has a place to, to help with that in the future. Um, one area that um, we think we can really speed up our continuous integration loops with is, um, it turns out whenever you build a simple package, uh, a big amount of time is spent actually setting up the build environment in the first place. And we think actually having an installer uh, might actually speed that up significantly. So we're kind of moving into the space of potentially having uh, a full Condorforge stack installer for build process and potentially for um, individual use. Um, but it turns out most importantly of all, I think, based on uh, the lobby outside, is that we probably need to get some Condorforge stickers. I think that's uh, top priority probably. So at this point, I'd just like to um, kind of point out that this has been a huge community effort, uh, and no one individual has kind of uh, been leading this, so to speak. Uh, Condorforge would not exist without continuous integration, and uh, I just want to point out how good Travis, Circle, uh, and Appware have been. Uh, and I guess all of our projects uh, also make use of things like Travis. Um, and we really, as a community, uh, really should say a big thanks to Travis CI. Um, the, there have been a big number of core developers of Condorforge. I think we're up to eight. Uh, and they've all been absolutely amazing at just keeping things turning, the wheels, uh, the, the cogs oiled and things. And we've got a large number of maintainers who are prepared to put their names to recipes just to keep them up to the highest possible quality uh, so that we can enjoy great distributions on Condorforge. Uh, and additionally, Continuum Analytics, who have been really great at helping and fostering the Condorforge uh, movement, I guess. Um, for instance, we have been given unlimited space on the Condorforge channel to upload distributions to. And we've had some um, fantastic support in extending and uh, adding new features, potentially, to Condor and Condor Build. And that's been really invaluable to getting Condorforge to where it is. 
So with that, um, I'm going to leave you with some, some numbers of where we're at with Condorforge. Uh, and they're really quite impressive for what amounts to pretty much six months' worth of uh, development effort. Uh, and I'm going to open the floor for any questions, and just as importantly, feedback on the Condorforge experience. Andy. So the question is whether uh, ConderForge eventually uh, might move away from anaconda.org, I guess, is, is the question. The build itself. It's just a, another place to store a file. So I can store it to my own uh, network accessible uh, place. So the great thing about ConderForge um, is that the recipes are fully open, and there's nothing stopping anybody building those on their own hardware. Indeed, that's precisely why my organization is funding this work for, for me, because we need to build these recipes internally. Um, in terms of the anaconda.org question, uh, I have right now no intention of moving away from anaconda.org, ConderForge channel. Uh, it's been a fantastic service, and we can continue to benefit from that. If you moved away from anaconda.org, you lose this dash C ConaForge, right? You then have to specify a full URL or something like that. So it's, it's a practical reason not to do that. But. So actually, we're, we're looking at um, developing the tools to mirror um, packages from one location to another. Um, and that some communities really want control. Um, so one challenge we've had is, um, as a community, we've kind of grown up collaboratively, but that's at the cost of individual control. And so there, there are communities who are interested in using ConderForge as a build system and then farming those out to their own channel. So I, th I think we can support that as a, as a community. Andre. I just wanted to say big thanks for doing this. We recently went through uh, with Sim Engine about two weeks ago before coming here, and it, the process was smooth, very responsive. Everything works on all three platforms. It works in Conda, so thanks a lot. Thank you. So uh, as a response to that, Andre, uh, the ConderForge core developers, um, I can't take all the credit for that. It's, it's been a huge community effort, and it's been a big collaboration. So, uh, so sorry, uh, uh, have you used comment on the comment on the relationship between PyPI and ConderForge? Um, I mean, honestly, right now, uh, it's my belief that Condor is the best tool for managing complex scientific software stacks. Um, and I think the work that Nathaniel showed us yesterday is incredible uh, and definitely going about things in the right, the right, right direction. Um, but it's not there yet. So for, for, for right now, ConderForge is um, Condor-oriented and will remain that way, I guess. Are you guys capable of handling um, things like uh, features for CUDA and MKL support on that? Uh, good question. So are we capable of supporting CUDA and MKL? Um, and the answer to that is, in order to do MKL stuff, we need the Intel compiler, right? Um, no? Oh, OK. That's why we're a community. <laughs> um, do you want to answer? Difficulty with, well, MKL is a licensing issue. Um, I'm not sure that any of us are clear uh, where, where it stands on what you can redistribute with MKL. And so if we have a build image that has MKL, are we, re are we redistributing it in that build image? 
Um, so it would be helpful to like have a sit down with a lawyer and make sure we're all on a good ground. When it, I know, but again, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> so, so CUDA, same deal, um, uh, just simply like usage model. How can you redistribute their tools? Um, and CUDA is also just the practical issue of how do you get a GPU-based machine, which you don't need to build, but you do need to test. And you absolutely want to run tests here. So that's all. OK, we can keep asking questions, but if we could have Brett Nall come up. So Brett Nall will be talking about, talking about uh, machine learning and time series next. Uh, but we can keep asking questions. This is obviously an important topic to the community. Uh, if you want to ask questions and the mic, if you come closer to the center, that'll also be very convenient. Any more questions? Okay, great. Let's give another round of applause.